Uh, that, that was when I was young and promising. It's okay. When you were young and promising, yes, and yes, uh, yes, yes. Uh, Coburn and uh, Winkel Magot from the AIC is here and they're super excited. Very yes. good. With that, it's my pleasure and honor to introduce Yanis. And, uh, a, a pleasure and honor to be here, where the Huskies are playing. Yes. So, um, what I want to talk to you about uh, is um, how, how to link data with modeling. And this comes from a lot of uh, work over many years. This is trying to give the title a funny, to give the talk a funny title, no equations, no variables, no parameters. And I will kind of try to explain what I mean by that. Uh, this is work over a very long time and people that are involved in this, uh, this is Bill Gear, the gear of gears method for those of you that have kind of ever played with integrators. He retired. 15 years ago, and then he came to a talk, and uh, we kind of hit it off, and after that, he works for free as an extremely talented postdoc, um, and he programs much better than anybody else in the group, including all the young people. It's, it is scary. Uh, Rafi Koifman is your neighbor. He uh, is, an, is a mathematician at Yale. Uh, a lot of what I'm going to tell you, in some sense, comes from his vision. He has a National Medal of Science and all that kind of stuff. He's a terrific guy. And then there's a lot of other people that actually do the work, and the most recent people that are responsible for what I will show you are Carmelin Silva, who did her PhD with me in Princeton in chemical engineering, finished last year, and then was promptly hired by Bloomberg. It's, it's a very strange feeling when you train these people, and then they go into a different direction. And then Ronen Talmon is a postdoc of Rafi's, who is now a professor of electrical engineering at the Technion, and he's very, very good. Okay, so uh, I'll kind of try and give you a little bit of a personal trip through this. Why did I get interested in looking at complex systems? Um, this is a paper from 1986. Uh, this paper uh, appeared in the New York Times before, or was discussed in the New York Times before it appeared in Physical Review Letters. It was written by Frisch, Haslacker, and Pomo. And it has a very strange title, Lattice Gas Automata for the Navier-Stokes. They what they basically did is that they found what are the right symmetries for a lattice so that if you have particles that are just randomly, with some rules, moving on the lattice, the statistics of the particles, the density of the particles, the momentum of the particles, were like Navier-Stokes. Uh, so the idea is we are not going to solve the PDEs. We are going to make such statistical mechanical problems you understand this is a little bit like a poor man's molecular dynamics. Instead of having molecules that are colliding, you have particles on a lattice. They jump from lattice to side to side. To side. They have some velocities. Uh, they may collide. But the idea is, what, why was this thing so important? Why did it appear in the New York Times before it appeared in PRL? Because a particle at the point is a zero or a one. And the rules for how the particles move are how zeros and ones change to other zeros and ones. And it doesn't take a lot to think that zeros and ones are bits in a computer. And the idea is that people were going to make special circuits that would be running this, you know. So instead of taking PDEs and turning them into code, you would get code that reproduces the PDEs intrinsically. And so the idea is that you would make special purpose hardware that would run this, and you would run this, and you would see the Navier-Stokes. And you would never have to worry about PDEs and singularities and discretizations and whatever. And so there was this amazing view at the time that we are going to create special purpose hardware to solve physics problems. And now, why was this important to me? Uh, I had friends. You know, the postdocs have friends, the, other, the, the postdocs in the other groups that work together, and we talk about what you do and what I do. And I was doing Navier-Stokes using the Navier-Stokes, and they were doing Navier-Stokes using this. And my movies and their movies were exactly the same. But all the tools that I knew, stability, bifurcations, fixed point algorithms, whatever, they were not applicable to this. Because this is just random particles jiggling around. And random particles jiggling around, this thing, when, when the Navier-Stokes has a steady state, when the flow has a steady state, this thing doesn't have a steady state. You have just particles jiggling around. Think about this again for a moment. Suppose that you have the Navier-Stokes to model flow in a pipe, and you have molecular dynamics to model flow in a pipe. The Navier-Stokes goes to a steady state if it's a laminar flow. 
The molecular dynamics, they never go to a steady state. The molecules, even when the flow is at a steady state, the molecules are stochastically, horribly, whatever, jiggling around. And so all of your beautiful tools about stability, bifurcation, fixed point algorithms, don't apply. So it seemed very strange to me. How is it possible that I and they do exactly the same thing, but I have a lot of tools from algorithms and mathematics to study it, and they, the only thing that they can do is that make movies and show me the movies. It's as if they only can do simulation. But I, who had PDEs, could do simulation, could do bifurcation analysis, could do stabilities, could do parametric continuation and sensitivities and so on and so forth. So there was something that was incongruous. These are two different models of the same thing. But on this incarnation, algorithms are applicable. On that incarnation, it's not. It's like show and tell. You can just run and look at it. It's like doing a physical experiment. You cannot do Newton on a physical experiment, right? So it took me a long time to kind of... It's not as if I spent my career saying, how am I going to bridge this gap? But at some point, eventually, I was able to do something, and that's what I want to talk to you about. And I, have, I like showing this slide. I've stolen it from, from Julio Tino, who is, um, who is a great guy at Northwestern. He's now dean of engineering for many years. He's also an artist. And he made this to say... There are problems that have a few degrees of freedom. These are simple problems, like a pendulum or billiard balls. And then there is problems that are complicated. They have many, many, many pieces, many degrees of freedom. But every degree of freedom is supposed to do some particular thing. And if something goes wrong, the clock starts, stops working, and I don't want to think what happens to the Boeing 747. And then there is complex systems, and complex systems have many, 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 many degrees of freedom, also like these. But, but all of these degrees of freedom are more or less the same, like molecules or fishes in a swarm or, I don't know, people in Wall Street. And somehow the idea is that macroscopic behavior emerges from these, the, the interactions of these things spontaneously. This is very bad math words, emerges, interaction, spontaneously. No theorems, no, no exactness. But I think that you all know what I mean. But the reason, so the reason that Julio made this slide is because he wanted to contrast complicated, where every degree of freedom has a job to do, with complex, where every degree of freedom is kind of more or less interchangeable with any other degree of freedom. But the reason that I kept the slide is because I want you to think at this. The billiard balls, if you think of them as billiard balls, they are simple. They, oops, they are a point, and it has a mass. Okay, it's a sphere, it has a mass, and then it has a momentum, and you have collisions, and you can do some constitutive equations about the collisions. But the important thing is, if you think of them as billiard balls, you can kind of try and model them. If you think of every molecule in the billiard ball, then this is a horribly complex system. There is Puno Avogadro number degrees of freedom in every ball, if you really model everything in detail. And kind of good luck trying to get a ball in a pocket if you have to calculate what happens to every molecule. What I really am trying to tell you is that simplicity, this is a complex problem. It is simple because we, we think of it as simple because we can usefully model it simply. We can usefully model this assembly of molecules as an idealized ball that has a center, a radius, a momentum, and some rules about how the collisions occur. So what I'm trying to tell you is that simplicity is very much in the eye of the beholder or the eye of the modeler. The systems, they really are all complex. The ones that we know how to look at so that we can deal with them as simple, we think of them as simple. The ones that we don't know how to look at, we don't know what the right variables are, what are the right macroscopic observables, those are extremely complex to us and we cannot say what happens. Another way that I like to think of this, maybe it's not a good example, is that you all know that there is things that it makes sense to try and model, and then there is things that it does not make sense to try and model because there is too many unknown things. Like, um, I don't know, I hope I'm alive next year, but, but I, we don't know if I will be alive next year. But the people, like the actuaries that, 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 that sell insurance, they have a very good idea about the expectation of a white male of N years being alive next year. So it's a problem that you cannot model at the level of the individual person, but you can model at the level of a distribution. And you can say something about macroscopic statistics. So what I'm trying to tell you is that simplicity has to do with do we know what the right observables are in terms of which we can do something, say something about the process. 
So something like 15 years ago, I, I came up with this thing that I call equation three, and I'm going to try and explain it. This is just a little example. It has to do, Tony Roberts is, is a very good friend, a great applied mathematician in Australia, and he was working with some people at Scripps, and they wrote a paper 15 years ago, and this had to do with plankton. So what I'm going to do is that I'm going to show you a complex system, and I'm going to ask you to look at it in two different ways. One that is a very complex, and one that is a little bit simpler. And I know that if I kind of click on the movie, yeah, page up, page. Okay, so, okay. It takes a little time. I should have played it before. Okay, so let me tell you what you are seeing. I'm stopping it. These are two views of the same thing. This is, it starts as being 20,000 organisms, 20,000 plankton, 20,000 points that are sitting on the surface of the ocean. And what these guys do is that they, they, they walk around, they give birth, they die, so the 20,000 is not fixed, it changes, and they are also being moved by the currents of the ocean. So there are some rules about how, so there are 20,000 points at the beginning, and the 20,000 points are running around and around and around, and now this is the micro view, and the micro view is horrible to observe, I mean, it looks like crap, but this is the, trust me, as I trusted Tony Roberts who wrote the paper, this is the right macroscopic view. You don't look at each of the particles, each of the molecules, each of the organisms, you look at the right statistics. And in this particular case, the right statistics is the pair correlation function who tells you, on average, how many neighbors you have in a neighborhood as a function of the size of the neighborhood. So the statistical mechanicians among you know about pair correlation functions and use them. What I want you to, to see, and I'm going to play the movie and play it once more, is that this is a horrible mess. But if you look at this, it looks like a very nice partial differential equation that evolves, maybe with a little bit of noise, monotonically, and goes to a steady state. So hold a moment, let me kind of play this again. So you see on the other side there is striations, there is messes, there is whatever, but the right statistics go to a beautiful steady state, which is stable and stay there. So what is it that I want you to see in this? What I want you to see in this, maybe I can play it kind of once more, what I want you to see in this is that something that in detail is horrible, if you really look at it at the right macroscopic level, is a very nice, smooth, nicely evolving thing that you would not be afraid. You would be afraid to model this, but you would not be afraid, or at least I would be afraid to model that, but I would not be afraid to model the other. And so this was for us, this is now we are sitting in the year 2000, uh, this was in some sense a conceptual, for me, a conceptual breakthrough. The conceptual breakthrough says, you know what, I, okay, so here is the rules of the game. I have the microscopic model, and the microscopic model is horrible and messy. If I was smart enough, I could figure out, and, and, okay, and somebody tells me, you know, Yanis, the right observable for this problem, the right macroscopic variable, is the pair correlation function. The thing is, I don't know how to write an equation for the pair correlation function. I only know how to write equations for the particles. If I had an equation, so think about this, if I had an equation for the pair correlation function, then I wouldn't need to look at the particles. What I could do, if I wanted to see where the pair correlation function would be tomorrow, what I would do is that I would uh, do forward Euler. I would take the current pair correlation function. If I had the equation, I could evaluate the time derivative. And if I had the time derivative, I could do an Euler step and predict where the pair correlation function would be tomorrow. But I don't have this equation. I only have the particles. So here's an interesting idea. I take an initial condition in macro variable space, pair correlation function and I create particles that have these statistics. I run the particles for a little bit, and I observe the evolution of the statistics. And after running them for a short time, I use this short run of the particles to estimate the time derivative of the macroscopic variables. And now that I have the time derivative of the macroscopic variables, I can take a big Euler step. So this is the heart of the story. I know that if I was brilliant, I could write a closed equation for the right observables, the pair correlation functions. 
But I'm not bright enough, and I don't have that smart friends either to ask them to write it for me. But now that I have the code, I can use the particle code to do short bursts of intelligently initialized simulations, and from these short bursts, I can estimate the same quantity that I would get if I had a nice formula. So the idea is you use the microscopic code as an experiment. It is very beautiful. This is all design of experiments. But it is not design of experiments for physical experiments. It is design of experiments for computational experiments. You are designing just the right computational experiments to give you the numbers that you do macronumerical analysis with. And all the tools of the systems people, so this is, this is why I like it, this is an, a tremendously engineering way to look at statistical mechanics calculations. You observe, you filter, you estimate, you know, all of the things that we do on experimental experiments when we are observing them, we are doing them, but we are doing them on extremely complex computational models. So this is, as I said, this is a very systems approach to scientific computing. You do these compu brief computational experiments, you get the numbers, and then from the numbers you do integration, you do Newton, you do uh, optimization, you do whatever. So, bottom line, if you have complex microscopic problems that really are, ef are effectively simple, you, you believe they're effectively simple, it's just that you don't know the right equations, then it doesn't matter. You can use the, the microscopic code smarter than just running it all the time, for all time, for all space, for all parameter values. You can basically run it judiciously in short bursts. You can design experiments on how to interrogate it smartly. And then you can still do all the macro computations you would ever do. It's just that the numbers don't come from formulas. They come from brief computational experiments. I think it is very simple and lovely. Why do you save? When do you save any time? Oh, you save time because this is a brief run. And from a brief run, you get, a, you get the time derivative. And then you can make a big jump. So when can you save? You can save if there is a big separation of time scales between the macro statistics, which evolve slowly, and the micro interactions between the particles, which are much faster and stochastic. If you want, you would run, I, I am BSing a little bit, but let's say you would run for a, 150 collision times between molecules, estimate something, and then jump over 2 million collision times, the statistics. By the way, you understand, you are not accurately integrating the molecules. You're accurately integrating the statistics of the molecules. If you really want to know where every molecule is, then you should do the molecules. Something, ah, you see, I talk too much. I haven't even changed my slide. Okay, so, uh, uh, and so this is now what, what we call coarse projective integration. Uh, we don't have an equation for the pair correlation function as a function of space and time, but we have the particle code. So we run the particle code for a little bit and observe it on pair correlations, use the observations to estimate the time derivative, jump the pair correlations. For the new pair correlations, we initialize particles that have the new pair correlations, run them for a short time, estimate the time derivative, and jump. So we are still doing macro systems modeling, but the important quantities for doing it, the time derivatives, they don't come from closed formula, they come from intelligent bursts of simulation with a micro problem. Um, okay, this is words. You can do math for this. So for problems that have separation of time scales, and these are papers with Bill Gear, which you see we're still in 2002 and 2003, so think of having a problem that has a separation of time scales. Remember, I told you there is a big separation of time scales between what the molecules do and what the fluid mechanics do. We are all kind of comfortable with chemical reactions that have a separation of time scales. Very fast dynamics down to a slow manifold, and then slow evolution on a slow manifold. This is the usual quasi-steady state assumption that you do in your reaction engineering class. So we run the full simulation for a short time, estimate the time derivative, make a big jump run the full simulation for a short time, estimate the time derivative, make a big jump. If you always made big jumps, it would be horribly unstable. But the fact that you do the correct detailed simulation for short times between the big jumps keeps it stable, and it works. And you can do the accuracy and the stability and the error estimates and so on and so forth. So what is it that we are really using? We are using smoothness 
in the macroscopic observables, not in the particles. In the we run in all of space for a short time. We observe the solution in all of space for a short time, and then we use this to make a jump. So this is smoothness in time at the macroscopic level that we are using. So the tools of the trade. We have the microcode, and we know that there exists a macro equation. It is important to be able to go from micro variables to macro variables. That is, look at the particles, what's the right density? This one, lifting, is more difficult. I give you the density, you make me particles that have this density. So I should be able to translate easily between micro and macro states. If I can translate easily between micro and macro states, then all of the runs are done with the mi mi micro code. All of the d runs are done with the particles, with the molecular dynamics. We're done at MS good. But all of the value that we get, they don't come from these runs. They come from the way we process the results of these runs so that we can extrapolate in time, so that we can extrapolate in space and in parameter. So the idea is that we are using, as I said, smoothness in the macro variables in order to save time, save space, save computation, and still get the right macro information. This is a very short kind of advertisement-like slide to tell you that in what I told you up to now, I was running in all of space, and I was only jumping in time. But also, this is what I told you, all of space and jumping in time. Actually, if you have smoothness in space, then you don't need to run particles in all of space. You can only need to run particles in small boxes and then interpolate the macro quantities across the boxes. And now what you can do is that you can combine this stuff. So this is something that we call patch dynamics. If there is both smoothness in space and smoothness in time, then what you can do is that you can only run the detailed code in small patches of space-time and then use smoothness in space to interpolate boundary conditions and use smoothness in time to jump in time. So if you want, you can use your microcode much, much, much more economically than if you were running it in all of space and all of time and all of parameter values and whatever. This is something that, this is a small calculation. Ah, hold. This is a calculation that we did with Bill Gear back then. This is a, okay, you have to kind of believe me. This is a 50,000 particle simulation of a fluid mechanics problem. If you want, it's like poor man's molecular dynamics. You have particles that jiggle around and their densities are, and momenta are doing fluid mechanics. And this is a burger's, it steepens and it is viscous and it is not so important what I want you to see here. This is space, this is time, and this is the solution. And what we do, you, you see that there is these big white stripes. The white stripes are there where we don't compute in time, we jump in time. And you see these little red, the, the, there is the red curve and the blue balls. The blue balls is the place where the particles actually live. Instead of running particles everywhere in space and time, we run particles in 2% of space, and if I remember correctly, something like 20% of time, okay? And we can still get the solution very nicely. Uh, why, it, you're really asking me, you're solving a PDE, how did you determine your mesh? It, you determine your mesh, thank you for the question, in exactly the same way that you would do it if you did an actual PDE with actual formulas. You would do the calculation with half the mesh and twice the mesh, and you would use the uh, distance. Oh, the how much patch is sufficient for? Uh, okay. so how much patches is exactly like how many discretization points are necessary in order to solve a PD accurately? You do it with 50, and then with 60, you use this to estimate the error, and then you decide if you need to add more or not. Are you converged with respect to the discretization? So uh, even though it is not exactly the same, it is 90% or 95% the same with adaptive time steps and adaptive meshes in traditional numerical analysis. Did I make a little sense? Not really. I, I want to know in terms of the extrapolation. Ah, uh, the extra. Okay, so I just told you how many patches. I didn't tell you how big they ought to be. That's what you're asking. No, yeah. No, no, no. Like the oil integration, like do I do next 10 seconds or next? Oh, that is very easy. That one I already answered. Again, you have a normal combustion code. How do you know what the time step should be? You literally, you do online error estimation. 
You do the calculation with one step, and then with two half steps, you use that to estimate the error, and then you decide if you are okay. This is exact. It is 95% because there, okay, why am I not saying it's exactly the same? Because here, you estimate the quantities from the run, while on a normal integrator, you evaluate the quantities. So there is a little extra thing about estimation, but the main idea is 95% is traditional numerical analysis. Okay? You seem happier. Good. So, um, we are engineers, so we should have a, a good example. I was very proud of, of, of well, of my post of Costas Yetos, who is now a professor in Greece, and you know that Greece these days is not doing very well, and, um, and of myself, and of Costas Pantelidis, whom you know. So this is pressure swing absorption. And I'm not going to say very much about pressure swing absorption. I'm going to assume that you know it's one of the processes from which we get nitrogen and oxygen from air. We have big tubular reactors full of uh, stuffing. <laughs> and what you do is that you run under some set of conditions, and then you run reverse under different conditions. You absorb, desorb, absorb, desorb, and you separate gases. This is a multi-billion dollar industry. And I want to tell you now, and this is the solution of the problem. This was with GPROM. So I, we worked with Pantelidis in this. This is the solution with GPROMs. This is space along the reactor, and then some concentration and time. And this is like one cycle and the other cycle, one cycle, the other cycle, one cycle, the other cycle. And this is the detailed problem. And now this problem is notoriously bloody difficult to get to steady state because it takes a long time to equilibrate. I mean, in order to find a steady state, this is a periodic operation, right? In order to find a steady state periodic operation, it takes forever. This is behavior as a function of cycles, yes? And you see it takes, as I said, a very long time. This is a blow-up. You see, this is one cycle, the other. One half, the other half. One half, the other half. I don't know if I, I could give this to you as like a little homework. Where is the fine code and where is the coarse code? What is the fine description? What's the coarse description? The fine description is solving the entire problem. Can you guess what the coarse description is? It's kind of a little bit on the plot. Do you see that even though there is all of this, there is an envelope for the maxima. The maxima live on an envelope. So you could run five oscillations, and you could estimate the time derivative of the maxima, and then you could jump 500 maxima. And then initialize there and run five maxima, and jump and initialize 500 maxima down the line. So this is this coarse projective integration that I was telling you. Run a little bit, jump. Run a little bit, jump. Um, do you see? I think it is a very beautiful example because it shows you that if you have something extremely complex and painful, which, however, has effective low dimensional behavior, you don't have to derive. An, it would be impossible. I couldn't, and I would, like, like the Clay Foundation, I would give a million dollars that I don't have to the guy that could get an analytical equation for the maxima. But you don't have to get the analytical equation for the maxima. You can integrate it without getting it. And so what we did is that we used these techniques. Uh, so this is, if you want, the kind of, uh, this gives you a bit of a philosophy of what we do. Our algorithms are wrappers. You have wrappers with a W, not, not wrappers with an R. Uh, um, um, so what you do is that you have a basic simulator. And what you do is that you build up a whole stuff that every time that you need the number, it calls the simulator and, and runs it intelligently a few times, processes the results, gets the number. And so what we did is that not only did we accelerate the stuff, the simulation, but we actually did fixed point calculations. That is, we guessed what is the operation. You see, when we want to find the steady state, there's two ways to find the steady state. You can integrate to get to the steady state, or you can do newton raphson What is newton raphson newton raphson does, say, does not say, as I run in time, I get to steady state. newton raphson says, here it is my guess, and if my guess is not right, I move a little bit. Well, then I change my guess so that I move less. I change my guess so that I move less. So you never run forever in time. You're just trying to find what is the thing that, if you run a little bit, does not change. And this is what we did here. We actually, instead of running to get to the steady state, instead of integration, we did Newton on the equation that we could not write down and could find what a steady periodic solution is. 
And these are the Floquet multipliers of it. It's not so important, but we could also do its stability analysis. So the main point is you have a detailed simulator. The detailed simulator could be molecular dynamics, if it is statistical mechanical, or it could be the detailed simulation of the pressure swing absorption. Somebody tells you what is the good coarse variables. This is very important. I kind of challenged you, and you did see it, that the macro variable would be an envelope. You have to have some idea of what the right macro variable is. That the right macro variable in the Navier-Stokes is density and momentum. Uh, you know, this is not an easy thing. Like, we all know that for chemical reactions, the right variables are concentration and temperature. Concentra if you are a molecule, concentration is a very easy thing. How many molecules are there? But temperature is a very difficult thing. Temperature is a statistic of some, some particular moment of the distribution of velocities. Why would it be that that is important? I, I, I don't know if I make sense. I mean, think of it. If you have, you, have, you have Avogadro's number of molecules running around in a reactor, concentration makes sense as a macro variable. How many are there? Temperature is a very strange statistic of, of, of the properties of the molecules, the temperature. How do you figure out that temperature is what matters and all of the rest of the stuff does not matter? Uh, so let me just say, this is another systems thing. This is very much an identification problem. You have something that has oodles of degrees of freedom. You suspect that two degrees of freedom matter. How do you figure out which combination of all of these many degrees of freedom is the thing that matters so that you can create a realization of the process? Again, I'm harping on this because I very much think and like that this is a systems person's way of looking at modeling the world. So this is now the second part of my talk, the thing that is kind of important and more modern because all the stuff that I showed you comes from 100 years ago, 2001, 2002, 2003, 2004. So this is no equations. No equations is I know what the variables are, Somebody told me what the right macroscopic observables are. It's the equations that I don't have. But the big difficulty is not so much the equations. The big difficulty is what are the right variables? If you don't know, if you have the very detailed code, and the very detailed code has millions of degrees of freedom, how do you know what is the right observable? What is the right degree of freedom? What are the two things that matter out of all of these degrees of freedom? So where do coarse variables come from? Do they come from some systematic hierarchy in mathematics? Like how many Fourier modes? How many moments of a distribution? They come from experience, from expertise, from knowledge or from brilliance. I mean, people have looked at experiments for 2,000 years and they kind of figured out what must be the same for me to get the same result. Or they come from machine learning. And so this is the place where the modeling that we do beautifully marries with all of this computer science stuff that the computer science people do. And make no mistake, or at least for me, the computer science people can do data mining better than I do. What the computer science people do not know how to do is how to functionally link the data mining that they do with the modeling that we know how to do. So marrying their technology. Okay, sometimes we might be lucky and do something before they do it. But marrying their technology with our PDE identification, whatever, solution techniques, is a beautiful new area for modeling in chemical engineering. This is data-assisted, if you want, modeling. And I actually think that all of us are in some sense lucky because we are here at the ground floor where, when this is starting. And we have a chance, if you want, to write the textbooks of what our kids will be learning about how to do modeling in 20 years. So I have a stupid little example. Okay, this is something that you all know. I have a system with a huge number of degrees of freedom, three. But the data tell me that, uh, well, yes, I mean, the data live in three-dimensional space, but they actually live on a plane. So what do I do? You all must kind of shout the students, we do principal components, we do principal components, we pass hyperplanes to the data, and instead of needing three, many numbers, three, to, to, to describe the data, we can make do with two numbers, only two, because we have coordinates on this plane. Well, the idea is the same, but only instead of doing principal components, you do kernel principal components. You do machine learning, you do manifold learning, you don't pass hyperplanes through the data, what you do is that you pass manifolds through the data. This 
is some, this is a revolutionary thing. This is something that happened, really happened around 15 years ago. If you, if you don't remember anything else from my talk, go just, and you haven't done it in your life, go and Google ISOMAP. Just Google ISOMAP. In 2000, there were two groundbreaking papers next to each other in science, one about ISOMAP and one about local linear embedding. And basically they said, they basically did rigorously nonlinear principal components. Uh, people were doing nonlinear principal components before. Uh, those of you, those of us that are old enough to remember not deep learning, but the old time of, of, of neural networks, people did auto-associative neural networks and they did find nonlinear principal components, but it was a huge, ugly, nonlinear, non-convex problem with no guarantee of working. You did it. And if it worked, and I personally, I was going to say I've made a lot of money out of United Technologies by doing that, it was not really a lot. It was a lot for me, not a lot, or a lot at the time for me. But what I'm telling you, it's one of these things where you do it, and if it works, it's great. But if it doesn't work, it doesn't, it's like a pun of functions. If you can find one, good. You cannot find one, it's not your fault. There may be not exist one, or there may exist one, or... So it's, what these guys did in machine learning is that by constructing convex and relaxations of the problem that are meaningful, they would actually guarantee that there would be a solution. So that was a huge thing. And, and as I said, if you, don't want, if, you, if you don't know ISOMAP and don't want to remember anything else from my talk, I want you to just Google ISOMAP and I will have been, you know, your hour with me would have been worth it. So I want to show you an example of doing this. We don't do isomap, we do diffusion maps, and I'll tell you a little bit about them, and that's what Rafi Koifman does, and it is glorious in its mathematics, but it is extremely, extremely practical. And so, you know, you're in Princeton, there's a lot of very good people around, and there is a very good people in the ecology and evolutionary biology department, and like a lot of people these days, they play with swarming particles. So you're going to see a movie, and the movie will have 11 little stars that are supposed to be little fishes in a swarm. And this comes from Ian Cousin, who, however, later was stolen by a Max Planck in Constance, and, and Simon Levin, which, who is a glory of ecology and, and who has, you know, has the Wolf Prize and the Kyoto Prize and whatever. Okay, so there's a bunch of little stars. Uh, there's, there's little fishes. And what do these little fishes do? They live in a one-dimensional world, and they are jiggling around. They make a random walk. Uh, also, the random walk is biased. If they see their friends going in some direction, they would like to kind of go along more with their friends. And if one of their friends is coming just across them, then they turn around so that they don't, don't step on each other. And the blue guy, oh, it's very funny. It's called an informed individual or a leader. And what this really means is that while everybody else just look at their friends to decide what to do, this guy looks at his friends, but he also wants to go 10% more this way. It's very funny how these colloquial words, you use them in mathematical models, and you say, what, what is an informed individual? What is a leader? It's a particle that wants to go 10% more to the right. So you run this. I, I, I like this example. I, I hope you will like it also. You run this. And you look at the particles, and above is the position of the group, of the swarm. And look, for some time they don't move, and poof, they moved a little bit. And now they don't move, and then they moved a little bit, and then they don't move, and then they moved a little bit. And so what I am trying to tell you is that this is the detailed problem. This is observations of the macro behavior of the detailed problem. And you see that what these guys are doing is that they are not moving with a constant speed, but it looks as if they are moving in a punctuated, it's like, it's like a bistable system. They either move, and when they move, do you see your eyes tell you they have the same velocity? You can tell it's the same slope. So they either move with some slope or are stuck. Move or are stuck. Move or are stuck. This is like having two wells and you jump from one. It's like a bistable system. And the main question, the thing that I'm telling you is, clearly the behavior is a bistable behavior. The thing is either A or B. But if I didn't show you the movie, if I just show you a snapshot, could you tell me if it is A or B? What is the right observable of the 11 little stars and the 11 little velocities that tells you I am A, running, or B, being stuck? What is the right macroscopic observable? So I had, this is another United Technology story, I had a very bright postdoc who was, 
hired by United Technologies. His name is Thomas Fruen, who was not only very smart, but very patient. What he did is that he, did, he, did, he looked at a lot of movies, and he chose this particular movie so that you will also agree and understand on what the right variables are. Look, when do they run, and when are they stuck, and try and figure what the right variable is. Whoops. So now they are not running, and they're not running, and they're not running much, and okay, now they're stuck. And then something will happen, and they will run again. And then they will get stuck. Okay, try to figure out by looking both above and below, what is it that codes if they're stuck or not stuck. Look at the leader. When the leader is at the front of the group, like now, they are stuck. And then some fluctuation will occur, and the leader will find himself, herself, itself in the middle of the group, and then they are running, and then, then, then it's at the stop, and then they stop again, you see? And so, Thomas, these are the rules, it's not important. So Thomas forms a hypothesis. He says, the distance of the leader from them, it's as if the leader is up front and waits for everybody to come with him, and when everybody is with him, then they move again. This is, this is just blah, blah. It's not what really happens, but it looks a little bit like this. So look, every time that the leader is far away from the middle of the group, they are stuck. The leader is far away from the middle of the group, stuck. Far, stuck. Far, stuck. Far, stuck. While if the leader is close to the middle of the group, they are running. Close, running. Close, running. Close, running. I submit to you that what Thomas did here, and this is very smart, okay, in addition to being patient. What Thomas did here is exactly, in my opinion, in my opinion, is exactly the same thing about all of us observing collectively phenomena for tens and for a year in the lab, for 10 years, for a hundred of years, and realizing, aha, this is what matters. So this is our brain doing the data processing, experience doing the data processing, and figuring out what the right thing is. When you pay somebody, you know, when you pay somebody to tell you about the future, this is kind of what you do. This is a person who knows what the right variables are, knows what to observe, and therefore can advise you, and you pay him because he knows what to observe. If you also knew what he is observing, or maybe he doesn't even know himself what he is observing, but he has enough experience in his head to kind of have his head judge what is the right thing that matters. The thing is, can we automate this? Instead of having Thomas do the modeling and look at the movies and figure out what the right observable is, can we get machine learning to figure out what the right variable is? And so I want to give you... Okay, I'm not, this is the no variables part. The first thing is, I know the variables, but I don't know the equations. I can still solve them. The second part is, I don't know the variables, but I look at the observations. I can still find the variables. The last part I will not tell you, except if you ask me at the end, is what if I don't know what the right parameters are, how do I find that? I can tell you about that too, but I will not get there because I want to explain a little bit to you how do you find the right variables. So the way that you find the right variables is that you take a lot. You see, you understand the main thing that's very important is are two conditions close to each other? Close to each other in what matters? You understand? If the thing that's important is the distance of the leader from the middle of the group, the details of where everybody else is, is not so important. So you have to figure out, out of your data, what is the thing that really matters. Two conditions are close to each other if the things that really matter are close to each other. The rest don't matter very much. So the way that this is done is that you take your data, and so each, each of these, hello? Yeah, of course, I'm pointing into my palm. So, uh, each of these points is a data point from a simulation. And what we do is that we connect these data points, we make a graph by an edge, and in this edge, we give a weight, and the weight is determined by this kernel. So, kernel principal components, that's one of the kernels. This is a diffusion kernel. Look at this kernel. The kernel says, uh, this is my distance, in, norm, in, in normal observables, and then this is what the 
what I think the thing that matters is. So please notice, there is a parameter t. The parameter t says, if your distance is much bigger than t, then you, this is zero. You don't really know if things are close or not. It is only if things are very close to each other that you believe the Euclidean distance. This says the Euclidean distance, the distance in all the observables, you only believe it if it is very small. If it is bigger than something, then you really cannot tell if things are really close or not really close. So what you do is you can either say you're doing diffusion on a graph or you're going to say you're finding the graph Laplacian. You can say you're doing random walks on the data. Don't worry so much at this. What you do is that you take all of your data points and for each data point, you create this kernel, use these kernels to make a big matrix, find the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of this matrix. It kind of smells like principal components, but it's not principal components based on the data. It is based on principal components looked at the data through a kernel. I know this is not satisfactory. Yes? Excuse me? If you, you are working on a spectral decomposition of the graph. But the graph looked with this metric, not the Euclidean metric of the data points, but this metric. Sure. Well, what's the, what's the solution of the diffusion equation? A Gaussian. Sure. So when I say the diffusion kernel, I'm saying exactly the same thing that you're saying. You're doing random walks on the data, diffusions on the data. So... Now I'm going to, okay, so this is my one slide. If you don't know about diffusion maps, I actually am going to teach you something useful. Why doing diffusion on the data has anything to do with finding the right variables to describe them? So, I'm, so this is like your basic intro math grad class. And if you had a good undergraduate teacher in differential equations, you've done it too. Take a parallelogram. Find the eigenfunctions of the Laplacian on the parallelogram. I, I will make sense. Just for the moment, follow me. Take the eigenfunctions of the Laplacian on the parallelogram with no flux boundary conditions. If you think about it, you will agree with me that the eigenfunctions, there is first a constant eigenfunction, and then the first eigenfunction is cosine x. Okay? And now I want you to think about what happens if you take this strip and color the points by cosine x. Between 0 and pi, cosine x and x are one-to-one -one with each other. This is the deepest thing, and it's a very simple thing that I'm telling you today. If you color your data by the eigenfunction of diffusion on your data, then the first eigenfunction of diffusion finds the x direction. Because the eigenfunction of the operator the first eigenfunction is one-to-one, one. the cosine x is one-to-one one with x. So the first, so this is why Koifman is a harmonic analyst. You're doing harmonic analysis on domains or on data. And the first eigenfunction of the Laplacian on the data is the x-coordinate. And the second eigenfunction will be cosine 2x and 3x, so they're just harmonics in the same direction. So you're not really learning anything more. But then at some point, you're going to get cosine y. And the moment that you get cosine y, you have both the x and the y parametrization of the data. You have found variables that parameterize the data. So this is supposed to tell you that diffusion on a domain finds the direction, the variables on the domain. Well, suppose you don't have a domain. You just have data sampling the domain, lots of data. Well, doing what we just did is just finding a discretized version of the eigenfunctions of the Laplacian on the domain. So you're not going to get exactly this, but you're going to get this modulo discretization errors. But again, you're do so whether you do the eigenfunction on the perfect domain or whether you're doing data mining on the points, the calculation is exactly the same calculation. And there are theorems that say that at the limit of sufficient sampling, this data mining stuff with the, with the Gaussian kernels gives you the x and y direction in the same way that you would have gotten it if you actually had the manifold. And the magic stuff is, if the data are not on a nice horizontal strip, but the data are on a curved strip embedded in who knows how many dimensions, it is exactly the same calculation. You're going to find the thing that goes down the curved ribbon, 
and the thing that goes across the curved ribbon, and you're going to have a beautiful set of variables, observables, that describe the problem. And Carmen and Silva, I asked her to do something cute, and she said, okay, this looks a little bit like the Starship Enterprise. So if you do the Laplacian eigenfunctions on Starship Enterprise, you're going to get, look, this is the azimuthal, and this is the radial coordinate. And if you do it on data, you're going to get the azimuthal and the radial coordinate. So basically, I told you that by doing kernel principal components or diffusion on graphs for the data, you find what the right variables are, which I think to this day is beautiful. Uh, and, and so this is the typical thing from, from the... This is from the isomap side. So this is very high-dimensional data, three-dimensional, that live on a very low-dimensional space, two-dimensional, and they, this is the Swiss roll data set for obvious reasons, or for at least colloquially obvious reasons. And you do this, you understand, you do principal components on this. It is two-dimensional, but there's no hyperplane that goes through it. So principal components don't work. What do I mean don't work? They work, but you, they, you need more principal components than minimum in order to describe this. You need three, and you could only do, do, you could do it with two. Yes? So uh, in the previous slide, yes? you said you're going to take the second and the yeah, I will take the, because the, the, the third, the fourth, the fifth, and the sixth are harmonics of the first. Right, How, gonna, they, they are describing the same direction. How do I know? Is there an algorithm? Yes, it was published last year. Okay. Plus, you can do it by common sense. Okay. It's so, easy. Like, in this, in this example, like, if you try to code this up yourself, and it always, it, like, you can say, like, straightforward uh, Laplacian eigenmaps. If you have a block something wrong, you, will, you don't really know. There is a... Given that the eigenfunctions that are useless as parameterizers are harmonics of the ones you've had so far, you can use this. I have a paper on it, but I actually also did the paper because I'd rather give a reference than, give, than tell you, you can do it. Trust me, if you sit down, for, like now that we've had this discussion, and even if we didn't have it, there is a systematic way of figuring out. Because the other guys are harmonics of what you've had so far. So you test. Are they harmonics of what I said so far? They are harmonics of what I said so far. Actually, I'll show you. Okay? I mean, it was on the previous slide, but I jumped over it. Okay. Look. Do you... What I want you to see... You see this curve? This curve is eigenfunction 2 versus eigenfunction 3. Do you see that instead of filling up space, you get a curve... This means that 3 is a function of 2. It's like, you know, trigonometry, cosine 3x can be written in terms of cosine 2x. You do the fourth one, the fourth one is, and, and then when you, get to the, when you get to the next informative one, this is 2 and 7, then you fill up. With, you, you understand? You don't get a curve, but you get a mess. You can do it more systematically than this, but that's the idea. I am kind of running out of time, so I just want to tell you the most beautiful thing that Thomas did. It, it, it looks ridiculous, but it made me so happy. So you do diffusion map stuff. So we did diffusion maps. You do Gaussian kernel principal components. Uh, there's all kinds of details. And frankly, uh, there is things that I say, all these things are all the same, that if the revered mathematicians that do these things heard me say this, they would shoot me. And now you're taping me because that's the differences that they feel are very important. But to me, as a poor practitioner, basically these things are doing something very comparable. Okay? And so this is Thomas's processing of the movie that I showed you before. This is the second and the third principal component, and you basically see that all of the slipping, when they're running, they are all clustered here, and all of the sticking, when they're stuck, they cluster here, and then all of the transitions between sticking and non-sticking -st and running and sticking and running, they fall on this curve, and this curve is one-to-one -one with phi two, because phi three is a function of phi two, okay? So this tells you that one, one variable is enough to describe the problem. And now you're going to tell me, yeah, this variable, it is the result of processing the data as an eigenvector, and, whatever. and physically, what is this thing? Now, this is a very important issue, and I will close with this. Even, okay, so I, let me tell you something that you all know. Suppose that you do principal components, so you have a chemical code, you have some big combustion code, and you find that things live on a three-dimensional manifold, and you do principal components, and the three-dimensional manifold is 0.7 times oxygen plus 0.2 times nitrogen minus 0.1 times carbon. Can you do chemistry? 
Can you do rate expressions with a variable that is 0.7 hydrogen plus 0.3 nitrogen plus minus 0.1 carbon? You understand? You're more comfortable with linear combinations of your variables, but if you ask the chemist to tell you how to write rate equations in terms of something that is 0.7 nitrogen and 0.3 oxygen minus 0.1 carbon, they would shoot you or, or, or throw acid at you, whatever chemists do. So, so this is then the most beautiful thing. So this is the bad thing about this. This is a glorious thing. It allows you to model usefully, parsimoniously, and whatever. But unfortunately, there is usually no physical meaning in your variables. You know, my best analogy, uh, um, I'm trying to make a joke. Let's see if the joke works. Think of somebody who, sh who knows about logarithms appearing in ancient times, where people don't know about logarithms. So you have a table for every number, you can give you the logarithm. So the poor other people try to multiply big numbers, and it is very difficult for them to multiply big numbers. But this guy takes the numbers, get the logarithm, takes the numbers, get the logarithm, adds the logarithm, and then returns back the result. The, he would look like a magician, wouldn't he? I mean, suddenly you have a technology that allows you to do something apparently impossible, but, but, but somebody has to understand what a logarithm is. And we have worked enough with logarithms that we understand them. But if somebody told you, here is a book, and for every number that you're going to give me, this book will give you a blood description of this number. And this blood description is useful for you to do calculations. But you don't know what the blah is. Would you believe the guy? I, what I'm telling you now, I'm trying to be funny. God help me. But it is a very important issue. If I gave you transformations of your variables that you don't understand what the hell they mean, but they are very useful in computations. Would you believe me? And I basically tell you, you would believe me if I, so United Technologies would believe me and would give me a consulting or a contract if I solved two or three problems that they couldn't solve otherwise. So probably I know something. And if we worked enough together, then you would learn what I'm doing and you would stop giving me consulting and contracts. But this is a very important issue. These transformations are in terms of quantities that don't make physical sense. They are minimal realizations of the process, again, for the aficionado systems people among you. They are minimal realizations, but the minimal realizations are not in terms of your own variables. They're in terms of something. It's a, a realization of what the truth is. So they are very useful, but unexplainable. And we have to kind of live with it. Maybe you don't think of it as a very important problem. But I mean, think of it. Suppose that I, again, go to United Technologies and tell them I can solve your problems by doing it this way, and all my calculations are in terms of these physically meaningless variables that come out of some code. I would either have to explain, or I would have to solve enough problems that they believe me. So what you see here, and this is, I'll stop with this, and again, it's a ridiculous, almost straight line, but I tell you that this is a work of beauty, and I can tell it because Thomas did it and not me. Every dot in this line, in this curve, is a snapshot of the movie of the particles jiggling around. This is the man coordinate. Thomas says the right variable is the distance of the leader from the middle of the group. This is the first non-trivial diffusion map coordinate. What do you see? What you see is the thing that was done by image processing in Thomas's head, which frankly also is not explainable. The result is explainable, the di distance of the leader from the middle of the group. But how did Thomas figure it out? Think of it. How did he figure it out? He looked at a lot of movies and he tried to correlate where it looks like this and it goes like this. This is math. It's just math done in your brain that you don't know how to describe. While the other one is math that is done on the computer and you have to write the code and you know how to describe. So these, you see, are one to one. Does this mean that Thomas is right? Does it mean that the computer is right? None. It means that both Thomas and the computer are one to one with whatever the truth is. No, yeah, it doesn't, so does, do you care? It's one-to-one. One. 
it's a good point, and we can. Do, your yardstick, you know, you may have, uh, I don't know, no, you, you, do the Indians have Arabian numbers? Did, did you have Indian numbers? So, uh, you know, but let's see, before you had Arabic, I mean, the Greeks had, did not have Arabic numbers. They had alpha and omega and uh, theta. And, so we have different sticks, but our sticks are one-to-one -one with whatever the truth is and to each other. So what you see is that both Thomas and the machine parametrize the same thing, and then there are, ah, I talk too much, but it is the end. I, I will only kind of have one more final bye-bye slide. Uh, and what I want you to see is that there's places, you see places where it's fatter? When it's fatter, maybe you need another variable. You see places where it's a bit straight? When it is straight, maybe this is not so informative a variable. The, the, more, the more nice the derivative is, the more by Lipschitz the, the, the function is, the nicer is the descriptor. And uh, all of this is effective simplicity, and I want to, okay, I had other stuff to tell you, I will not tell it to you, I finish with this, because this is in some sense in, in, in oh, good, it's 12.04. You can leave, but the ones that can spare the time, let me tell you this, I, I love it. So this is, this is me kind of paying tribute to my teachers, if you want. Um, Skip Scriven was not my advisor, but for those of you that are chemical engineers and know him, he was a god in, the, in, in our profession. And Bob Brown who is now president of BU. He was provost at MIT. He is a glory of science, at least for us chemical engineers. And Bill Sullivan also is, but this is the student that went to academia, and this is the student that went to industry. So probably Bill Sullivan at ExxonMobil has made much more money than Bob Brown has made at MIT. And this is 1980. And Phil Holmes, who is my colleague in Princeton, who just retired and who wrote the book, Guggenheimer and Holmes, for those of you that do nonlinear dynamics, from which generations of, of engineers and applied mathematicians has been trained. He is the editor of this book. And the book, look at the title of the article. It is bloody, it's very pretentious. Computer-aided analysis of nonlinear problems in transport phenomena. It's like solving systems problems, you know? I mean. I'd be scared to write a title like that. So look at the abstract. The nonlinear partial differential equations of mass, momentum, energy, species, and charge transport, everything in the kitchen sink, can be solved in terms of functions of limited differentiability, no more than the physics warrants, rather than the analytical functions of classical analysis. You know what they're saying? You can do mathematics on the computer, not just by paper and pencil. You know this. You can know that you can do simulations on the computer. That's not what they're saying. They're saying you, you don't just do some simulations in the computer. You can do the same mathematics that people can do by paper and pencil. You can do it correctly on the computer. And you use basis sets consisting of low-order polynomials, systematic, that's finite elements. This is 1980. It's finite elements. Systematically generating and analyzing solutions by fast computers, this is Cray ones, employing modern matrix techniques, that is banded and frontal solvers. The nonlinear algebraic equations are solved by Newton Raphson. The Newton Raphson is greatly preferred because the Jacobian is a treasure trove for continuation, stability, bifurcations, sensitivity analysis, asymptotic estimates of effects, blah 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 blah. Basically what they're telling you is you can do on the computer, what the big mathematicians in the past were doing by paper and pencil with fast computers and modern matrix techniques. So in Newton's time, the equations were written in words, if you read the Principia, and the solutions were written in words. And then after Newton, the equations were written in formulas, and the solutions were written in formulas in closed form. And then the equations were written in formulas, and the solutions were written in linstead poincare series. And then the equations were written in formulas, and the solutions were written computationally. And all I'm telling you is that now the equations can be written computationally, and the solutions can be written computationally. And it is still fast computers, but the fast computers may not be a Cray-1, but it would be a cluster of a bunch of CUDA program GPUs that are each running a, a copy of these brief bursts of simulation that you need from estimation. And the modern matrix techniques are not banded solvers, but things like Newton, Krilov, GM, REST. That is iterative, matrix-free linear algebra stuff that I didn't tell you about. 
And so I think everything I told you is just, so this was Scriven. Scriven called this computer-aided analysis. And what he meant by computer-aided analysis is, is that you do on the computer the same stuff that people do by paper and pencil when they have analytical expressions. But we do it with the same rigor or the, with accurate bounds or something like that. And um, I guess what is the last thing that I want to say? Uh, I guess let me kind of finish on a funny note. Scriven taught all of chemical engineering computation, scientific computing, modeling, computational modeling, if you want. His students, Eris' students, Klaus Jensen's students, who is now at MIT, every, you know, it was like a river to the department. He kind of taught everybody. He brought everybody up. And then many years later, a very good postdoc of mine, who is a professor in a math department now, was in a conference in... Uh, was in a conference in Chicago. I think it was a conference made by uh, one of the fluid mechanics packages. Um, what were they called? Uh, up something, the, the, like a big fluid mechanics code. And, and he came back and he told me, Yanis, you know, there was this guy, Scriven, from Minnesota, and he gave a talk, and, you know, he thinks a lot like us. And I told him, no, Mike, we are his students. We think like him. And so it is... Kind of touching for me every time when I kind of say this, but there were people that were real forerunners. And maybe today, because of the data science of the computer scientists, we maybe can again be able to do something for modeling in our profession, as those guys did with finite elements and cray ones at the time. Sorry for running so much over. Thanks. Thank you very much for a very exciting and interesting yep. uh, talk. We really don't have time, but we'll uh, Sorry. open it just for, for maybe, a couple Maybe of questions one, one question is a token one. Ask something. Come, somebody from the back. Yes. Okay. So, so in the patch, uh, the word, patch dynamics, yes. Patch dynamics. So I guess because you're only looking at tiny patches, you, you could effectively pre-compute compute many patches. Uh, okay, fine, enough. Yes, this is very good. So how many of you have heard about ISAT? Do the word ISAT mean anything to you? They should. It is, it is a common sense thing, but it's an important common sense thing. It's in situ adaptive tabulation, which is what you say. And it's another one of your neighbors geographically. It is Stephen Pope at Cornell. And the basic idea is, yes, uh, if you've computed something, keep it in a database. Next time you come in the neighborhood, interpolate from the nearby stuff. Yes, you're right. Uh, let me finish. I'm very bad if you give me the... If you give me time, I will fill it up. Uh, let me tell you an incarnation of what you're telling me. I would like you to think of what happens when you write an algorithm. Any algorithm of the types that we... An integrator. So you have an algorithm that does the integration like the Runge Kuta and whatever, and this algorithm from time to time calls a subroutine. For this x, give me f of x. Think of it. Whether in the subroutine lives a one beautiful line compiled formula, whether it lives a huge lookup table, whether in the subroutine lives a... Uh, I was going to say a genie, but let's say a, a, an Indian holy man. That no, what's the right word? A, no, 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 not a shaman. Uh, there is a word. No, no, it's an Indian word. Um, a guru or something like that, that, that knows all the answers in the world. Or whether in the subroutine lives a telephone that calls somebody's lab and says, do the experiment and tell me the number now. The algorithm does not know and does not care. The algorithm asks a question and needs an answer in order to go further. Whether the answer comes from tabulation or from a beautiful line, the Navier-Stokes equations. Right. So, uh, okay, here is my last attempt at a joke. It probably will be politically incorrect. Suppose that you want to court a beautiful German damsel. I am male, I would... So you want to tell her a Greek poem. So you need to translate it. 
Should you learn German so that you can translate the poem? It'll take many years. She will leave. Maybe you can have a dictionary so that this word corresponds to this. And Okay, this is terrible for literary translation, but basically I'm answering the same question that you're, an equation has the answers f of x can tell you f of x for every possible x. But a stupid algorithm does not need all possible x's. A newton Raphson does 10 iterations. It needs f of x at 50 places. At the beginning, when you start, you don't know where the 50 places are going to be. So that's why people think they need to have an equation which has all the answers, so that if you need it at 50 places, you can have it at those 50 places also. All I am saying is, get the 50 F's on the fly as you go. And if they're in a table, get them from the table. So I, I hope I did not offend anybody with my German courting poetry stuff. Okay? Kind of. Okay. Tabulation works also. Yes. Uh, that's a small... Ah, thank you. The Institute. Thank you very much. For your visit. I have a question of last place. Okay. Very late. So yeah. let's thank our speaker. You're, you're free. Thank you. <laughs>